Suppose that some people have thought that you put in too long and hard a day, that you might endanger your own health that way. How do you protect your health from day to day? We do have long days, and uh, the problems uh, that uh, require attention uh, require time. And uh, you, you never have as much time as you want to spend before making these decisions, but you must make decisions. Uh, the first uh, 100 days uh, were uh, filled uh, to almost to the breaking point. But I have adjusted myself to the schedule, and with the help of the most competent people uh, that President Kennedy surrounded himself with, I'm now able to I wake up in the morning and read my papers and uh, read the documents that were left over from the night before that I need to pass upon, and have my briefings and uh, my breakfast, and come to the office between 9 and 10 o'clock. And then I work at a rather feverish rate until 1.30 at 2, and I have a swim and take out 15, 20 minutes. Then I go and have a lunch, or usually a business lunch, working lunch. And about 3 o'clock, I take a little nap for 20 or 30 minutes, and that breaks the day for me. And then I'm good till 8 or 9 that night and have my dinner. And after dinner, I see TV news and... Then I engage my night reading, and I usually read till about 1 o'clock. I don't require uh, too much sleep, but I'm never in better health. And I enjoy the work that I'm doing and the people with whom I'm working. And I, I never felt better in my life. Mr. President, you did manage to quit cigarette smoking some years ago. Any advice for those of us who haven't managed? I gave up cigarette smoking because uh, the doctor recommended I do so, and... I missed it every day, but I haven't gone back to it, and I'm glad that I haven't. Mr. President, I gather from what you say that we need not expect any kind of political announcement from you until very close to the convention. Is that so? I would not want to preclude one. I, unless I, uh, there was substantial consideration involved. I, I see no uh, reason to make any now, and I don't anticipate it. But if uh, circumstances uh, indicated that one would be uh, uh, fruitful, uh, necessary, I wouldn't hesitate to face up to it. Well, while we are on politics, I wonder, we have heard everybody else's analysis of what happened in New Hampshire. Would you give us yours? I really don't know. I think that uh, we are always inclined to put too much emphasis on the actions of uh, one primary, but uh, it seemed to me that the, the People of the state heard all the candidates and decided to select uh, one of their neighbors that apparently uh, they knew and approved. And, uh, I, I have a very high regard for Ambassador Lodge myself, as I do for some of the other candidates. Has his serving in Vietnam during a political campaign been at all awkward or embarrassing for the not, administration? Not to the president. Uh, he, so far as I've been able to detect from his actions, he has uh, been doing nothing but uh, the job as ambassador and doing it as best he could, and I've seen nothing that interfered with that work. Did uh, Secretary McNamara bring you any new word from Mr. Lodge just recently when he returned about yes. Mr. Lodge's future plans, how long he might stay on the job, and so forth? No, no, I've had no indication that he plans to leave the job at all, and if he did, I'm sure he would let me know. Uh, Secretary McNamara brought me some... Uh, uh, recommendations uh, concerning the situation out in Vietnam in which uh, Ambassador Lodge expressed his views in which they were in general agreement with Mr. McNamara and other members of the team, but nothing political. Is it your opinion that Mr. Lodge has behaved properly and within the scope of his role as an ambassador considering that he's been injected into the political arena? Yes. Well, you've had reports in the last uh, day or two from the ambassador to France and from Secretary McNamara. Uh, can you tell us anything of what you what he what he reported to you from Vietnam? Yes, he made a, a very lengthy report, and I think a responsible and constructive one. We're going to consider it in the Security Council further the early part of the week. Uh, we have. Uh, problems in Vietnam, as we have had for 10 years. Uh, Secretary McNamara has been out there. This is his fourth trip. We're very anxious to do what we can to help those people preserve their own freedom. 
We cherish ours, and we would like to see them preserve theirs. We have furnished them with counsel and advice and men and materials to help them uh, in their attempt to defend themselves. Uh, if uh, people would quit attacking them, we'd have no problem. But for 10 years, uh, this problem has been going on. I was only reading a letter today that General Eisenhower wrote to the late President Jim 10 years ago. And it's a letter that I could have well written uh, uh, to President Kahn uh, uh, and sent out by Mr. McNamara. Now, uh, we've had that problem for a long time. We're going to have it uh, for some time in the future, we can see. But uh, we are patient people, and... Uh, we love freedom, and we want to help others preserve it, and uh, we're going to try to evolve the most effective and efficient plans we can to continue to help them. President Kennedy said on the subject of Vietnam, I, I think, that uh, he did believe in, in the falling domino theory, that if Vietnam were lost to communists, that other countries and areas would soon be lost. Thank you, Do you believe that? I think it would be a very dangerous thing, and I share President Kennedy's view, and I think it could have, the whole Southeast Asia be involved, and that would involve hundreds of millions of people, and uh, I just uh, think it's too, it cannot be ignored. We must do everything that we can. We, we must be responsible. We must stay there and help them, and that's what we're going to do. Mr. President, up in New Hampshire, Governor Rockefeller criticized what he called divided council that was going out from Washington to the leaders of Vietnam. He said that while you and Secretary Rusk and Secret Secretary McNamara were committed to winning the war and defeating the Viet Cong, the Senate Majority Leader, Senator Mansfield, seemed to find favor with the idea of neutralization advanced by President de Gaulle of France. What is your reaction to Governor Rockefeller's criticism? Well, I think that uh, uh, governors should know that Senator Mansfield is very experienced in the field of foreign relations and s serves as a distinguished member of that committee and when he made his speech in the Senate he spoke for himself and so stated he was not uh, speaking the administration viewpoint and he did not leave any such impression from time to time he has uh, given me his counsel uh, over the years uh, in this general area of Southeast Asia but when he made this speech uh, he spoke for himself entirely and uh, there is no division in the administration between Secretary Rusk and Secretary McNamara and myself. Uh, we all feel alike on the matter. And, uh, I think that uh, there could even be some division between uh, uh, Mr. Rockefeller and Mr. Lodge, judging from what you've said. Uh, Mr. Lodge uh, sees things pretty much as we do, and we're going to continue with our program, and it's uh, going to be a responsible one, and uh, we think a fruitful one. Do the recommendations that Secretary McNamara brought back from his last trip envisage a continuing role for Mr. Lodge in handling policy in South Vietnam? Yes, yes, he has a very important role. He, he met with me in my office two days after I, I became president, and I said to him at that time that you are my top man there, and I want you to have the kind of people you want. I want you to carry out the program you recommend, and you'll have our support here. And uh, he has worked very hard at that job, and we have sent him some new people from time to time, and we will be sending more. And uh, he has command of the full resources uh, uh, that we have out there, and uh, he works very well with our people. One of your speeches at the University of California in Los Angeles indicated a kind of hint to me that we might carry the war to the North Vietnamese if they didn't quit meddling in what you called a dangerous game. Uh, are there any such plans that you can talk about at this time, sir? No, no, and I, I made no such hint. I said it was a dangerous game to try to uh, uh, supply arms and become an aggressor and deprive people of their freedom. And that is true, whether it's in uh, Vietnam or whether it's in this hemisphere or wherever it is. President, do we face the decision on Vietnam of the order of magnitude of Korea, for example? No, I don't think so. Uh, uh, I think that uh, we have problems there. We have difficulties there. We have had uh, for 10 years. And uh, as I told you, a uh, uh, good many things have come and gone during that period of time, as long as uh, uh, there are people uh, trying to uh, preserve their freedom, we want to help them. 
Well, Mr. President, not only do we have a new administration in this country, but we also have what might be described as a new world, since it is said now that the post-war world is, is over, and the American leadership is challenged and questioned, both by friend and enemy alike, in many places now. So it is an entirely different world, for a very different world, from what it was a few years ago. What is your view and assessment of it? How do you see the American uh, role from here on, now that we are no longer the unquestioned leader of the entire West? Well, I think that as long as we're living in a world with 120 nations, that we've got to realize that we've got 120 foreign policies. And we're living in a world where we recognize 114 other nations and some that we don't recognize. And uh, on... Uh, I think uh, at this time that our nation is held in high esteem and respect and affection generally among the peoples of the world, uh, of the free world. And uh, I uh, realize that we have uh, discouraging incidents from time to time. And we have problems. And because we try to help with those problems, sometimes the role of the peacemaker is not a very happy one. And so for that reason, uh, we uh, have to uh, do things that... Uh, uh, we don't want to do sometimes and they're rather irritating and sometimes we're abused because we do them and sometimes we're misunderstood but uh, if uh, the final result is good uh, then uh, uh, our action is justified about ten years ago an American Secretary of State termed neutrality as something immoral not long ago President Kennedy talked about making the world safe for diversity is a more and more diverse world with the diminishing of the importance of the great alliances a, a trend toward a safer world, do you think? Yes, I think so. And you must remember this, that we are having all the uh, new nations that are merging. And they, uh, they're coming in without experience, and uh, they, they have their pride, and a good many of them uh, have uh, feelings that, uh, pent up feelings that they have nurtured for... Uh, 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 years and years, and uh, they have an opportunity to express themselves, and sometimes uh, it looks a little odd for a, a, a prime minister of a new country to come in with a pistol in his hand and arrest an American charge d'affaires, but uh, that does happen, and uh, we, we have to be prepared uh, for those developments and try to understand them and try to provide leadership that will uh, 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 keep us from... Uh, uh, getting uh, in deeper water or more trouble, and that's what we're doing. And uh, it, it's sometimes our people become very impatient. Uh, they cut the water off on us in Cuba, and I got a good many recommendations from over the country as to how to act uh, very quickly. Some of them uh, said, uh, some of the men want me to run, run in the Marines, send them in immediately. Uh, well, uh, upon uh, reflection and evaluation and study. Uh, realizing not many people want more war and none of them really want more appeasement, you have to find a course that you can chart that will preserve your dignity and self-respect and uh, still uh, uh, bring about the action that's necessary. So instead of uh, uh, sending in the Marines to turn the water on, we send one admiral in to cut it off and arrange to uh, uh, make our own water. And uh, we think things worked out. To, uh, best they could under those circumstances. But there are going to be these demands from time to time. And, uh, people who feel that uh, all we need to do is mash a button and determine everybody's foreign policy. But we're not living in that kind of world anymore. They're going to determine it for themselves, and uh, that's the way it should be. And we're going to have to come and reason with them and uh, try to lead them instead of force them. And I think, have no doubt, but what for centuries to come that we'll be uh, a leading force in molding opinion of the world and I think the better they know us the more they'll like us. Is there any progress Mr. President in the deadlock over Panama and the absence of diplomatic relations with that country? We have been very close to agreement several times. I have no doubt but what uh, agreement will be reached uh, that will uh, in effect provide for sitting down with the Panamanian authorities and uh, discussing the problems that exist between us and being guided only by what's fair and what's right and what's just and trying to resolve those problems. And when that will come about, I don't know. 
We are anxious and willing and eager to do it any time suits their convenience. What's the hitch right now, Mr. President? I think there's some... Uh, first, they have an election on. And uh, I think that, uh, the, that uh, translating our language into their language, uh, that some of the uh, agreements that we have to discuss these matters, uh, uh, they, they perhaps feel that they'd want stronger language than we're willing to agree to. Uh, we want different uh, expressions from what they want. It's largely a matter of trying to agree on the kind of language that will uh, meet their problems and that we uh, can honestly, sincerely agree to. We're not going to agree to any preconditions to negotiate a new treaty without knowing what's going to be in that treaty and without uh, sitting down and working it out on the basis of equity. And uh, we think that that language can be resolved and will be resolved in due time. Mr. President, what is your assessment now of uh, General de Gaulle's behavior in the last year or two? What, what, what do you think about it? Well, it's not for me to pass judgment on uh, in relation uh, General to us, uh, de Gaulle's conduct. Uh, my conversations with him have uh, been very pleasant. I would like to uh, uh, see him more in agreement on uh, matters with us than he is, uh, such as recognizing... Uh, Red China. We did not uh, think that was uh, wise uh, for France or for us or for the free world. But uh, that's France's foreign policy. That's not ours. And in his wisdom, he, he decided he'd follow that course. And that's a matter for him to determine. Does the fact of French recognition now increase the prospect that the Red Chinese may be voted into membership at the U.N.? situation changes from time to time, but we don't think that they will be voted into membership, and we hope not, and don't believe they will. What would be our reaction vis-a-vis -vis the U.N. if they were admitted? Well, uh, we'll have to cross that bridge. I don't want to admit that they're going to be admitted and don't think they will. Well, Senator Goldwater, for example, has argued that we should withdraw at once if the Red Chinese are admitted. Well, that's Senator Goldwater's view, and I don't think they're going to be admitted, and I don't think that we'll have to face that question. Well, one you do have to face soon, Mr. President, is to say something to Congress about foreign aid. Do you, that yes, seems we, to have reached a peak of uh, the opposition to it. seems to have reached some kind of peak last year. What, what do you think the future of it is? Is it, are we going to be able I to... I think it's going? going to be very tough to get a good foreign aid measure through the Congress this year. Last year, President Kennedy asked for four billion nine hundred million. Uh, he later had that request carefully studied, and he reduced it to four billion five hundred million. He got a three billion appropriation uh, after uh, after I came to office. I signed the bill, and uh, there was reappropriated about four hundred million unexpended balances, three billion four hundred million. Now I have conferred with the leaders uh, in the House and Senate on that matter, and they all admit that it's going to be more difficult this year than it ever has been before. Although I don't think uh, that's justified. Nevertheless, our request is we're not going to pad our request. We've got $3 billion for this year, and we will ask uh, for something in the neighborhood of that uh, for next year, and we'll ask only what we need, and we hope we get what we ask. But it will be appreciably under what was asked last year, and uh, approximately the same that we got this year. Uh, we think that we are justified in spending three or four cents of our tax dollar to uh, protect the million men who are in uniform, our men scattered throughout the world, and keep them from going into combat. And this is the best weapon that I have. Mr. President, is there any one <clears throat> root cause for the apparent slowness of uh, the Alliance for Progress? Yes, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's very difficult to get 21 nations to all agree and get uh, their systems changed and their reforms affected and uh, to blend into uh, uh, their uh, governmental philosophy uh, the modernization that's going to require, be required to make the Alliance for Progress a success. Uh, we're distressed that it uh, hasn't been more successful, but we haven't lost faith. We're having a meeting Monday with all of the ambassadors from the Organization of American States. Uh, we are having a meeting Monday with all the ambassadors from the Western Hemisphere. We're calling in all of our own ambassadors, and the three groups are going to meet, and we're going to point out uh, the weaknesses and the slowness uh, 
of certain reforms that are required and the cooperation that we must have from their country because there's no use of uh, uh, making big investments and uh, uh, taking our taxpayers' funds and, uh, unless uh, these reforms are affected. And we're going to make an appeal for a united attack that will uh, give new life uh, to the Alliance for Progress, and we have hopes that it will be successful. Are you terribly disturbed about the resort to street protests, demonstrations, civil rights, and other things that uh, is taking place now almost all over the country? I think that uh, uh, when the Senate uh, acts upon the civil rights bill, that we'll have the best civil rights uh, law that's been enacted in a hundred years. And I think it will be a substantial and effective answer to our racial problems. Uh, the Negro was freed of his chains a hundred years ago, but uh, he has not been freed of uh, uh, the problems brought about by his color and the bigotry that exists. And this bill goes a long ways to taking the battle from the streets uh, into the legislative halls and into the courthouses and into where these differences should be settled. Of course, we have a right to petition, and we should petition when we have grievances. But I think the most effective thing that can be done, and I think great progress has been made uh, under the leadership of President Kennedy and the Attorney General and others in the last year in getting uh, uh, all the people of the nation to accept their moral responsibility and take some leadership in this field where there's been so much discrimination. And uh, I know of nothing more important for this Congress to do and to pass the Civil Rights Act uh, as the House passed it. And I hope that can be done after due deliberation. I think it will uh, be a great step forward for the nation. I think it will make us much more united. And I can't think of any single thing we could do to strengthen American foreign policy more than to pass the House Civil Rights Bill in the Senate. You are confident that you can get a civil rights bill substantially like the House bill without major modification? We want to very much, and we're going to the Senate will have to work its will, and we believe that a substantial majority favors the House bill, and we believe in due time it will be able to work its will. Well, are you concerned, Mr. President, of what might happen if this filibuster is still going in the late spring when the schools are out and the kids are out and idle time on their hands? I don't want to predict that uh, the Senate will be, how long it will be discussing this bill. Uh, I'm hopeful and I'm an optimist and I believe they can pass it and I believe they will pass it and I believe it's their duty to pass it and I'm going to do everything I can to get it passed. Mr. President, you've now been president for something over a hundred days. You've been around Washington for more than 30 years. How is the view from the inside as compared with the view from the outside? Well, it's a much tougher job than uh, from the inside than I thought it was from the outside. I've watched it since Mr. Hoover's days, and I realized the responsibilities it carried and the obligations of leadership that were there and the decisions that had to be made and the awesome responsibilities of the office. But uh, I must say that uh, when I started having make those decisions uh, and started hearing from the Congress that uh, the presidency looked a little different when you're in the presidency uh, than it did when you're in the Congress. Mr. President, Thomas Jefferson... And vice versa. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson referred to the office as a splendid misery. Harry Truman used to talk about it as if it were a prison cell. Do you like it? I'm doing the best I can in it, and... Uh, uh, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Thomas Jefferson said the second office of the land was an honorable and easy one. The presidency was a splendid misery. But uh, I found a great interest in serving in both offices, and uh, it carries terrific and tremendous and awesome uh, responsibilities. But uh, I'm proud of this nation, and... Uh, I'm so grateful that uh, 
I could have an opportunity that I've had in America that I want to give my life trying to see that opportunity perpetuated for others. I'm so proud of our system of government, of our free enterprise, where uh, our incentive system and our men uh, who head our big industries are willing to get up at daylight and work till midnight to offer employment and create new jobs for people, where our men who are working there will try to get decent wages but will sit across the table and uh, not act like uh, uh, cannibals but will uh, negotiate and reason things out together. I'm so happy to be a part of a system where the average per capita income is in excess of $200 per month when there are only six nations in the entire world that have as much as $80 per month. And uh, while uh, uh, the Soviet Union has three times as many tillable acres of land as we have, and they have a population that's in excess of ours, and they have a great many resources that we don't have, uh, that if properly developed uh, would exceed our potential in water and oil and so forth. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we have one thing they don't have, and that's our system of private enterprise, free enterprise, where the employer hoping to make a little profit, the laborer hoping to uh, justify his wages, can get together and make a better mousetrap. Uh, they, they have developed this into the most powerful and the leading nation in the world, and I want to see it preserved. And uh, I have an opportunity to do something about it as president. And I may not be a great president, but as long as I'm here, I'm going to try to be a good president and do my dead level best to see this system preserved because when the final chips are down, it's not going to be the number of people we have or the number of acres or the number of resources that win. The thing that's going to make us uh, win is our system of government. 